morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Lord, let your word come alive today in each one of us. Let us be renewed and restored and anointed when we hear your word spoken to us. We love you so much, Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for giving us as a gift your only begotten Son. And all you ask is that we believe in him and receive him so that we will not perish, but we will have eternal life. Jesus, we love you so much, and we thank you for being present with us. Guide us now in the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, I'm Jessica, and I am sharing on number four uh, on page 22. Read Numbers 21 and John 3 and explain what Jesus meant. And I wrote, The people in the desert had to look upon what their sin had done to be saved. Their sin had caused many to be bitten by a deadly serpent. They had to look upon that serpent to be saved. Jesus explained to Nicodemus that he, the Son of God, would take on the sin of the people to save them from eternal death. They would need only to look at his death on the cross and repent of their sins taken on by Christ and believe in him to be saved. Amen. Um, this question is um, day three, number B, write to Jesus about the gift of understanding to you. Dear Jesus, I know that understanding is the second of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. I am deeply humbled and grateful, Lord, that you lavished your love upon me and gave me the gift of the Holy Spirit. This gift that dwells in my heart and enlightens my mind helps me grow day by day in the understanding of what you have said and done. It illuminates your teachings and your word given through the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for not leaving me to my natural reason, which is so limited and leaves me empty, not to mention foolish. Thank you, Lord, for this gift of the Holy Spirit, because it helps me to order the actions of my life toward a final end that is not final, but eternal. The gift of understanding helps me to perceive more and more how everything is a gift of your love for my salvation. My name's Diane, and this is my meditation and revelation for day three. Dear Jesus, blessed are they who have not yet seen, but yet believe. The first time I heard this verse, I was in first grade, and Sister Mary Frances was telling this Bible story and giving us a visual. She stood at the front of the room with her big black habit on and pretended that she was Thomas and that Jesus was standing next to her. She was having this conversation between Jesus and Thomas, and then she suddenly thrusts her hand out like she was sticking it in Jesus' side. I really only thought of this verse pertaining to Thomas until a few years ago when my friend Rose attended the WCF retreat for the first time and she was slain in the spirit. I didn't attend the retreat, and I have to admit that I definitely was jealous of Rose, but I did believe her. And then this verse kept coming into my head. Blessed are those who believe but have not yet seen. And I wondered if maybe I was more blessed than Rose because I believe but I haven't seen. <laughs> and the revelation is... No. <laughs> you know the answer is no. And I also know you asked Janine, Rose's sister, if she thought you were more blessed than Rose because you haven't seen. And she said no, too. <laughs> Diane, when I tell you no, you don't need a second opinion. <laughs> Hi again. I'm sharing um, on uh, week four, day five, he must increase, I must decrease. And my meditation, Lord, this reminds me of the litany of humility, which keeps coming up these past few weeks. So I will take this as a confirmation that you would like me to incorporate it in my prayer life. So as I sit before you in adoration, I humbly pray, O oh Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. 
Deliver me, O Jesus, from the desire of being esteemed, from the desire of being loved, from the desire of being extolled, from the desire of being honored, from the desire of being praised, from the desire of being preferred to others, from the desire of being consulted, from the desire of being approved, from the fear of being humiliated, from the fear of being despised, from the fear of suffering rebukes, from the fear of being calumniated, from the fear of being forgotten, from the fear of being ridiculed, from the fear of being wronged, from the fear of being suspected. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire that others may be loved more than I, that others may be esteemed more than I, that, in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease, that others may be chosen and I set aside, that others may be praised and I go unnoticed, that others may be preferred to me in everything, that others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should. And then my revelation was from 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And then the Lord said to me, Jessica, I did not ask you to write out the litany of humility so I could point out to you your areas to improve. I asked you to write it out so I could reveal to you how far you have come. Wow. Um, this is my meditation for uh, day five. What grabbed my attention in reading this scripture was the explanation John gave to his disciples regarding the bridegroom. The wedding is about the joy of the groom and his bride. They are to be the center of attention. The bridesmaids and groomsmen are only there to enhance that joy and share in it. The bride belongs to the groom, not the best man. John, being the best man, rejoiced that the groom had come to take his bride. This illustrates so well the great virtues John possessed. He was obedient to his call, he was deeply humble, and he joyfully diminished all the while evangelizing to everyone he encountered that Jesus was the Messiah who God sent from heaven. Lord, I pray that I may be as obedient to my call as John the Baptist, and that I may be as humble and joyful to always point to you as my hope, my strength, my everything. And my revelation was, <clears throat> the Lord impressed upon me Luke uh, 728. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Jesus said to me, you and all my children who accept me are those least ones who are greater than he. You have been given the grace, you have been given the mercy, you have been given the Holy Spirit to enable and empower you. Do not take this lightly. Go into the world and be a beacon of light, a voice that cries out the truth so that more and more souls may be able to say, yet Janice, or each one of your names, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. We don't feel that way, do we? <laughs> so I ask the Lord again, Lord, would you speak to the hearts of your people? Not so much what I would say, but what you want to speak to their hearts and allow them to know the power of your love and presence with each one of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so here we are. We're still on Lesson 4 and Days 3, 4, and 5. Uh, moving through John uh, 3, 9 through 16. And so John 3, 9, our first point today will be Nicodemus' encounters with Jesus. And Jesus said this, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, 
so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And our second point is uh, Jesus' truth and the gospel is spoken. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Now this is the very heart of the gospel message. In this day's lesson, God's gifts are revealed. And since salvation in Jesus is a gift, we need to receive the gift. Have you ever given a gift to anybody um, and they open it, and I mean, you even wrapped it pretty and put a big bow on it, and been so excited how your bow looks. Oh boy, I made this bow and it looks so pretty and everything is colorful. And they open up the present and say, oh, thank you. <laughs> that is definitely no fun. I even remember, I was sharing with the leaders, I even remember when um, my, the first grandchild was born in our family, so my first niece, um, I was so excited about her birth and the gifts. I would even decorate the boxes. I remember one time I put a merry-go-round on top of one of the presents. I think that the wrapping was much prettier even than the presents I was giving her. But anyway, it was a fun thing. But God has, has given us this gift, and so we need to receive the gift. We need to receive the gift with joy, and um, we need to take joy uh, in this gift that God has given us. God gave his only begotten son. He gave Jesus to us as a gift. And we need to receive that gift and, and be joyful in it. Have you ever known anyone who didn't open their Christmas gifts from you? I haven't either. But it did happen to me. And I was so shocked. Um, I didn't find out until July. Because this... This little boy had received so many gifts, so many gifts, he didn't bother opening all of them. And I thought, wow, he didn't even, because I, I said, oh, I gave, I gave this book to him. He said, oh, he didn't get it. And I said, well, oh, he didn't open all his presents. And I said, I said, oh my gosh. So does that happen to the Lord? We don't receive the gift that God has given us in Jesus Christ. It happens to Jesus. Many don't receive the gift he is. And so that's what one of our uh, thoughts are today. We need to receive the gift of joy. And um, so anyway, um, our third point today is he must increase and I must decrease. The work of John the Baptist is accomplished. So John says this in 1 John 5, 11 through 12. I love this. God gave as eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever possesses the Son has life. And so, um, last week we spoke about the words of Jesus that we must be born again through water and the Spirit to have life eternal in the kingdom of heaven. And so we reviewed all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the sanctifying gifts of the Holy Spirit that the church calls the sevenfold gifts in Isaiah 11. We talked about the charismatic gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12, and we talked about the fruit of the Holy Spirit that was in Galatians, and that we bear these this fruit because of being a temple of the Holy Spirit, and we can operate in those gifts because the Holy Spirit is in us. God has given you his entire Holy Spirit. He doesn't hold anything back. So anytime you need any of those gifts or charisms or fruit, of the Holy Spirit, it, it, they are available to you. You just have to walk in that power. And so what Jesus is teaching us is really beyond our understanding. So it is only through faith that we understand. And this is a thought from uh, St. John Chrysostom. He said, only those who are born again are illuminated and can really understand who Jesus is. When the soul is born again, it is created anew in the likeness of God. And so I would like to share with you uh, the scripture in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 17. It says this, And for anyone who is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old creation has gone, and now... The new one is here, but it is all God's work. It was God who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ 
and gave us the work of handing on this reconciliation. So we not only have to receive that gift ourselves, but we must be willing to uh, share that gift with others. And so um, only faith uh, will help us understand this. So in the same way Nicodemus came to Jesus in the dark, that is what happened to us. We were in the dark. And according to St. Paul, I'd like to share with you what he said about being in the dark. He didn't say being in the dark. This is what he says. Make sure that you are not included with those rebels who do not believe. You were darkness once. Now you are light in the Lord. Be light, children of light. Because the effects of light are seen in complete goodness and right living and truth. Try to discover what the Lord wants of you, having nothing to do with the futile works of darkness, but exposing them by the light that is within you. The things which are done in secret are things that people are ashamed even to speak of, but anything exposed to the light will be illuminated, and anything illuminated turns into light. Amen? Amen. And so that is who you are. You are light in the Lord. You were darkness once. And this is the, what the Lord had given me, that in the same way as we were darkness, we have come out of the darkness, according to St. Paul and his letter to the Ephesians. We were darkness. And so we have to come out. Now we are light in the Lord. And so we're challenged to have nothing to do with the works of darkness, and we must expose any darkness in us to the light. And we, of course, know that Jesus is the light of the world, so we need to give him our hidden secrets and things we're ashamed of, and let Jesus' light purify us by his light. Uh, we can't do this by the, we can do this by the sacramental gift of confession that reconciles us to the Father and be set free from our wicked ways, so we may be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's that light of Christ that brings the Holy Spirit to full um, evidence in our lives. And so the scripture says, for God so loved, and we know by the Ten Commandments that God is a jealous God. He says, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no strange gods before me. Well, what are some of these strange gods? I want to share with you today. Uh, we don't want to fall back into darkness, and that is the point of this um, sharing today. We don't want to fall back into the darkness. And this is what the scripture says in Deuteronomy. When you come into the land... Yahweh, your God, gives you, you must not fall back into the habit of imitating the detestable practices of the nation and the natives there. There must never be anyone among you who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, who practices divination, who is a soothsayer, an augur or sorcerer, who uses charms, consults ghosts or spirits, or calls up the dead. For the man who does these things is detestable to Yahweh your God. It is because of these detestable practices that Yahweh your God is driving these nations out before you. You must be entirely faithful to Yahweh your God. And so we know that there are certain things that we're called not to do. We're not have to have strange gods before our holy God because he is, um, he is a jealous God. So we don't want to fall back into darkness. How how can we do fall? How do we fall back into darkness at times with things we don't even understand or know? We don't realize we're doing it. So I have an example for you, and this is where I'm sharing this today. We don't want to fall back into darkness. First of all, we we do not want to be lukewarm about receiving the gift of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who died on the cross for us. And Jesus himself said it this way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now we all know that scripture. Say it with me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we don't want to follow any other way or think we can use any other means to get to the Heavenly Father except through Jesus. Also, we don't want to use other practices that will lead us away from Jesus, thinking that we're doing something wonderful. Now, in our area, there are New Age practices 
that are easy to fall back into. And through these, we can easily be led astray without meaning to. An example of distortion is yoga practices. People want to do yoga exercises because they think uh, they are only exercises. But the reality is that yoga can, be, can lead you to worship other gods in a very subtle way that you don't even know you are worshiping other gods. In our area of Encinitas, and I thought maybe it's because of the self-realization fellowship that is located in Encinitas on the beach. Um, but yoga is very popular. So popular that practitioners of yoga brought yoga meditation into the Encinitas school district many years ago. At the same time, they brought uh, in tolerance of other faiths other than Christianity, and the Christians were uh, called to tolerate these other practices like voodoo practices and witchcraft. Now the interesting thing is about 20 to 25 years ago, the teachers did not allow the elementary school students to give reports on Christian beliefs and practices like Christmas in their um, essays. They didn't want those stories, but allowed them to write about witchcraft and voodoo practices, trying to be all-inclusive and asking people of faith to be tolerant uh, to these other religions and practices. And they would practice yoga in the classroom. It was used to practice meditation so that they could calm the children down in some way. Now, yoga and its sister practice, Reiki, is taught to nurses because somebody thought it was a good idea to help patients be less stressed. So they would teach them how to do these yoga practices. This is the key. Even if we are Christians and say the name of Jesus, even if we are do when we are doing yoga, the exercises, um, and we're doing these and tell ourselves it's only exercise and stretching, and uh, but I'm not I'm not worshiping those gods that I, and so we're actually using prayer postures to Hindu gods when we do yoga, of which there are about I thought 1,254 of them, but I decided to Google it last night, and uh, it says that. Um, the uh, one answer was there are 33 main gods and 33 million other ones. I was like, whoa, well that's quite a difference. But yoga was used when Jesus was on earth and his response was, you know his response, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so Jesus did not practice yoga. He wanted us not to do that. There is no other way to God, we know that, but the cry of some women is, it's only exercise and stretching, and besides, we just love the, uh, the clothes you get to wear, the outfits. Well, there's a story about a lady who had come to Women's Christian Fellowship on Tinka Dilly years ago, and what she said was when she came in, God had me that week talk about uh, why we do not practice yoga, and this lady, she was so sweet, I just loved her so much, and she was, um, she worked at a place called the Golden Door, which was a fancy um, place where people, the women went to get massages and it was a spa, and so she did massage and that kind of stuff. And so um, what had happened was when I gave that talk, she was shocked. She was absolutely shocked because she practiced yoga and she practiced Reiki. And she told me the following week that when she went home, she was astounded and shocked because when she opened her apartment door, she lived in an apartment at the time, she opened that door on the wall facing her instead of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which she used to have there, she had a picture of the Maharaji, one of the Hindu people who led. And she, so she said, I was shocked. I went through my house, I pulled all the information out about yoga and Reiki, and I threw it in the trash and made a decision to follow Jesus now. And so she was she was such a light in the world. I have another funny story about her. I can't resist telling you. It was just so funny. Well, I was giving an example one day. I was doing like, I had her in front of me, and I was going to share how do we lay hands on people, because it's not Reiki, but we lay hands on people. God calls us to do that. And so I said, Estelle, would you come on up and, and stand in front of me? And Dory, would you stand behind her? Not that anything's going to, I'm thinking nothing is going to happen anyway, but I want to show us now when we lay hands on somebody. So I'm saying to her and to all the ladies teaching them how to lay hands, lay your hands on a per person. And I said, and remember, it's not 
uh, us that is causing the power, but we look to God and we ask Him to, to touch them and heal them through us. And when I said that, through me came this powerful move of God because Estelle just shot backwards and knocked Doris over. <laughs> she wasn't expecting her to, to um, be slain in the spirit, but it was very powerful and a funny experience. I would say, oh gosh, God used that. And then all I said was, it's the work of God. And there it went, the work of God. So now we know how to lay hands on it. It's a God work. It's not this foreign inner or international energy. So the sister practice of yoga, of yoga is Reiki, and this is what the uh, USCCB says about it. That's the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops, and the church says about Reiki. It is another form of practices that can lead us astray because we think it is simply laying on of hands. But the USCCB says a Catholic who puts their trust in Reiki would be operating in the realm of superstition and deception. It will corrupt one's worship of God because it calls on a universal cosmic energy. And so when people are using this Reiki, they think an energy is coming through them, and, and quite possibly, but it is not the energy and power of God. So the article says, um, it is the responsibility of all who teach in the name of the church, ooh, ooh, that's me, to eliminate such ignorance as much as possible. Reiki therapy is not appropriate for Catholic care or retreat centers to promote or to provide support for Reiki therapy. In the same way, yoga recognizes a cosmic creator that emphasizes self-realization. And many say it is impossible to separate the exercise from the meditations of yoga. And that comes from the Hindu people who use yoga as their religious and faith. The common mantra in yoga is known as Soham, which translates to, I am the universal self. Unlike our Catholic faith, where we lift our minds and our hearts to God and make uh, invitation to Je Jesus and receive his gift of love, the yoga meditation is a focus on self and becoming empty of all other things so as to use this prayer posture to honor the Hindu gods and become gods themselves. Now, maybe I've gone too deeply into this, but also the evangelical, um, the encyclical that was written by Pope John Paul II called Jesus the Bearer of Living Water points out the concerns of yoga and Reiki and say they are practices that lead people away from Jesus and the triune God. And Pope Francis has said recently, when you practice yoga, you don't know what you are opening yourself up to. So you could easily be opening yourself up to any spirits contrary to the spirit of Jesus. So we don't want to fall back into the dark, but we want to be a true light for the world. And it's easy to fall back into the dark in ways that, that surprise us. And some people have said, like when Estelle said, I had no idea that this opened me to other spirits contrary to the spirit of Jesus. So now, Jesus tells Nicodemus in our lesson today, that the Son of Man, and remember that's how Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, 85 times in the Gospels, that he must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. God used the serpents in the desert to save the people from death when they looked upon it. In the same way, Jesus proclaims when he is lifted up, he will be a savior to those who look at him on the cross and believe in his saving work. People will be saved from eternal death. Jesus is talking about being saved from the eternal death, meaning the fires of hell. Remember that when we are born again, we are born again through water and the spirit. And at that time, we die with Christ and we are already raised up with him again. And we carry that indelible mark, the Dominicus character, the tells the uh, spiritual realm who we are. Now Jesus is talking about being lifted up on the cross and also he is lifted up in glory at his ascension. And Acts 5.31 tells us God the Father lifted up Jesus to be our Savior and God. And so in the same way as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, they had to look at that because that was the cause of their sin. And so Jesus 
We place all our sins on him when we look to him and he died for our sins. Remember that there are four last things. They are death, judgment, heaven, or hell. But Jesus explains to Nicodemus the plan of God for those he loves and says, for God so loved. Then we realize God gave us a choice. He said through Moses, God sets life and death before us. He invites us to choose life, which means believing in Jesus in this day and time, in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. To all who believe in him, he gives power to become children of God. And when we receive him as Lord, we live in him, and he lives in us. We are the temple then of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we have the fullness of joy in our lives? According to St. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when he was asked by the people, what must we do to receive this Holy Spirit? Peter's answer was, you must repent, every one of you, and be baptized. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So let's go back to this thought. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? These are the statements from the commentaries and the catechism. Number one, believing with all our hearts that God is, as Jesus declared him to be, a God of love who forgives us. The second point is we must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He was one with God, and he knew the heart of God. And the third point is we must believe Jesus is telling us this truth about God's love and that all salvation comes from God's love through Jesus. At the foundation of everything, it is God is love. God loves everyone. God cannot not love because he is love. And he has revealed the fullness of his love through Jesus. And then by sending his Holy Spirit to all who ask. Through the Holy Spirit, the love of God comes alive in every believer. So even though the Son of God, Jesus, is revealed, he has revealed the love of the Heavenly Father. Some people refuse to believe, and so those who refuse to believe are condemned because the scripture says in verse 19 of our lesson, they refuse to believe the light has come into the world and they prefer the evil. It is like people who believe in abortion. We just had our election. It was just terrible in a sense. Um, the things that happened here in California with the abortion being approved. Um, some women don't want to give birth to life. But out of selfishness, they don't want to be bothered with the child. I even heard some famous actress say that. She used sex as a recreation, she said. So babies are murdered in the womb. Now these women have not considered the possibility of even living a chaste life by respecting their bodies and not having sex out of wedlock. Um, I heard a homily by Father Alter. Altar, I think that's how you pronounce his name, that even voting for someone who you know upholds abortion is a mortal sin. I didn't know that, but I heard that recently. And so even voting for people who are supporting and, and, uh, and hoping for more abortions, it's a sin to vote for them when you know that. So some for some people, sex is recreational rather than holy and sacred. So last week, we listed the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But in that same chapter of Galatians, chapter 5, St. Paul lists the works of the flesh that lures us. And this, this list is all under the heading of self-indulgence. The first one, there are, um, I've listed 12 here and combined a couple of them. The first one is fornication gross indecency, sexual irresponsibilities, idolatry, sorcery, feuds and wrangling, jealousy, bad temper and quarrels, disagreements, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, those who behave this way and will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's kind of scary, isn't it? That's a, that's a list that's terrifying. Everybody says, no, I don't want to do that. 
I want, I want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, and self-control. That's what I want to walk in, and that's the fruit that we want. We don't want these other self-indulgent things in our lives. But let me say this. Does God love them who commit these sins? That is an emphatic yes. God loves all of us. God's love sent Jesus, and Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. He, he forgives us, but he hates the sin. He loves the sinner, and he wants us to repent. In other words, he wants us to turn away from our sins when we recognize them and turn back to him. We simply need to love God and follow his example by loving others. No matter even if we recognize the sin that our friends are in or the people that we know, uh, I am so grateful for God's love, and especially through others who do not judge my sin. So like Jesus, who told us about God's love, let us make every effort to not judge anyone else's sin, but simply love them and let them know God loves all of us. God has no favorites. He loves all of us. Because we follow Jesus and believe in God doesn't mean he loves us more. No. God's love is all-powerful and ever-present to everyone at, at any time they choose to receive it. When someone says to me, I don't go to church anymore because I'm always asking people, are you a Christian? Or, oh, are you a Catholic? You know, I'm always having this conversation. It's a way to begin evangelization when I'm in a restaurant or whatever, or I see somebody wearing a cross. And um, I had a funny story one time. One of my friends, she was a leader at the time, she said, oh, I said to this woman at the... Um, who was waiting on her at the bank, she said she was wearing a cross. And, and so but she said she was a cross dresser. She didn't really believe in Jesus. She was just wearing it for his jewelry. So, oh, hello. So anyway, that was interesting. So God's love is all powerful. So when someone says, oh, I, don't, I do believe that I don't go to church anymore, but I say to them, God loves you and you are welcome back anytime. Come back because God loves you. And so now, our last point is Jesus with his disciples. They go into the Judean countryside, and they stayed with him there while he baptized. But in case this confuses anyone, in John chapter 4, verse 2, the evangelist makes it clear that it was not Jesus himself who baptized, but only his disciples. This was the way Jesus was training them up and helped them um, exhort people to conversion by calling them to be baptized. So John the Baptist's disciples complained. John had not yet been put in prison. He was also still baptizing. Well, the disciples of John the Baptist complained. They said, Rabbi, the one whom you bore witness is here, and he is baptizing, and all are going to him now. A little jealousy was there, spiritual jealousy and whining going on, wasn't there? But like the disciples complained to Jesus before in Luke 9, 49 and 50, they were complaining that some who are um, casting, there are some people who are casting out demons in your name, Jesus, and um, we told them to stop, but they didn't. Jesus said, they are, if they are not um, against us, they are for us. And so that was Jesus' response. He wants everybody to use his name. In the power of his name, you can cast out devils. Um, so now, John's baptism, just a reminder, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And he was calling people to, um, to be prepared for the coming of the Messiah. So he made it clear to his disciples, I am not the Christ but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, and the friend of the bridegroom rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. So, therefore, my joy is now complete, John the Baptist says. He must increase and I must decrease. Now, John's mission is subordinate to the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And John says... He is, that John the Baptist says, I'm like the best man and only help to prepare for the bride. The bride is the people of, of um, Israel and all who believe in Jesus. We are the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. There's a little story that I have many years ago. Um, it was probably 1980, but I was teaching the women that we are the bride of Christ, and so I was sharing that with Sister Caroline, who was um, helping our our 
religious ed um, at the time she was heading that up. And so when I told her, I shared that all believers are the bride of Christ. She was highly insulted and agitated and very irritated with me. And she said, well, that was why I became a nun, so I could be the bride of Christ. And I said, oh, well, she was very unhappy with me for saying that all believers are the bride of Christ. So if she had had a ruler, she probably would have smoked me. <laughs> anyway, John was the voice in the wilderness used to proclaim the coming of the Messiah. And John knew he had completed the plan and purpose of God had for him in his life because his mission was now accomplished. He had pointed out who the Messiah was by saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And now uh, Jesus was teaching his baptism was a baptism of, for the forgiveness of sins. And that was the difference between John's baptism of repentance, Jesus' baptized baptism is done in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So he was teaching his disciples, and in Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And know that I am with you always, yes, even to the end of time. So in the same way as John had a purpose, so we have a purpose also. And that is to prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus. So whatever we do in the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to make sure that God gets the glory. And that will be the way we decrease so he might increase. We need to proclaim Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Amen. Amen. So, Lord, I thank you for this word given today. I ask that you allow it to take root into our hearts, Lord, and to bear fruit eternal uh, for your sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen.